So, um, well, thank you all for um, coming to our last um, Grand Rounds of the calendar year. Um, it's my distinct honor to be introducing Dr. Thomas Crawford, our Grand Round speaker today. So I'll just tell you a little bit about him. Um, he started his medical journey or his journey in medical school in Memphis at the University of Tennessee before going on to residency at um, the prestigious Duke University. After which he followed that up with a cardiology fellowship at WashU in St. Louis before completing his training in cardiac electrophysiology at the University of Michigan Ann Arbor. And he stayed on as faculty since then and is now a professor of medicine, specializing of course in devices and cardiac electrophysiology, providing great care to his patients with um, an interest in arrhythmias and congenital heart disease and um, performing procedures on those patients as well. And um, most related to his presentation today, he's the principal investigator of the My Heart, Your Heart Project, which is a cardiac pacemaker reuse initiative that is being held at the University of Michigan Cardiovascular Center. He and his team are evaluating the concept of pacemaker reuse, its safety and efficacy, as well as the ethical and regulatory issues that are involved. And um, I'm personally aware of and involved in um, how this trial has helped to save many lives across the globe, and I am a huge fan. Um, I hope you can give him your attention as he discusses the use of re-sterilized cardiac implantable electronic devices in resource poor countries, a notion whose time has come. Dr. Crawford. Uh, wonderful, thank you uh, for such a nice introduction. Uh, I'm speaking today about a topic that is uh, very dear to my heart. Um, among all the projects that I have worked on, uh, this one um, um, strikes me as the most meaningful. Uh, I'll be speaking about the project My Heart, Your Heart, which really is a project that um, aims to create a blueprint for pacemaker and ICD reuse for indigent patients in low and middle income countries, patients who otherwise have no other means of getting the device. It was established uh, about 10 years ago at the Cardiovascular Center at the University of Michigan. There are many people who are part of this work and who have devoted themselves to its success. Dr. Martin Luther King once said of all the forms of injustice, inequality in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. At the beginning, it all started with an older gentleman whose uh, wife uh, received a pacemaker at our center. Uh, she passed within a couple months of undergoing her procedure. Her husband knew that uh, she would have wanted her pacemaker to help somebody else. Uh, it uh, had been removed from her body um, when his wife was cremated, and the husband uh, brought the pacemaker uh, in a box, uh, came to the cardiovascular center, and Paige, one of our uh, fellows at the time, Dr. Tamir Bauman, that's the uh, picture in the center of the slide. Uh, Dr. Bauman was one of our outstanding EP fellows at the time, and he basically landed with his box with a pacemaker, did not know what to do. Uh, the patient uh, said, I hope you can use this. My wife would have wanted to help someone rather than it going to waste. So to Tamir um, connected with uh, one of our uh, most senior mentors at the cardiovascular center at Michigan, which is Dr. Kim Eagle. That's the photograph on the right. That is really the beginning of our story. Uh, the two uh, physicians, Dr. Bauman and Dr. Eagle, were co-founders of the project. And when Dr. Bauman um, went to practice in Illinois, um, I essentially inherited the, 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 the wealth of this project, the significance of this project. And I've been trying to be as good a steward of it as I can. Um, throughout the last decade, um, there was a large number of volunteers who have helped with this, and we have developed a, a means of um, collecting the devices, evaluating them, reprocessing them, uh, all with the idea of providing free devices 
to patients who otherwise have no access to those devices because of cost. Um, so let me just outline some specific points for our discussion today. Uh, I will talk briefly about the global healthcare disparity uh, in patient access to cardiac implantable electronic devices, pacemakers and defibrillators. I'll explain how device reuse can function as means of providing essential therapy. I will discuss key observational studies and meta-analysis done in a variety of countries, which over the last several decades demonstrated safety and efficacy of uh, device reuse. Um, I will then provide an overview of the work that Project My Heart, Your Heart uh, has done to this point. Um, I will uh, briefly explain how we reprocess the devices. Um, and then I will share the good news with you about our ongoing perspective randomized clinical trial in, in which patients in low and middle income countries uh, who cannot afford a new pacemaker are randomized to reconditioned versus new pacemakers. Finally, I will touch on how this all fits in the broader context of alleviating disparity in access to care. And then I will briefly also discuss some of the uh, legal and ethical considerations. So a number of publications in the last several years have attempted to provide some sense of how patient access to uh, pacemaker and ICD reuse compares across countries. Uh, the burden of conduction system disease or the patient's comorbidities are not presented in those studies. Um, many of the low-income countries have much lower average uh, population age and, than in the high-income countries. But the cardiovascular disease uh, burden is increasing dramatically in the low- and middle-income countries. Um, and so they have not allocated the resources needed to provide proper uh, care to, to cardiovascular patients. This chart uh, is an effort to show how many pacemakers are implanted in each country per 1 million population. Um, it's analogous to a per capita comparison of incomes, for example, as it accounts uh, for the uh, different populations in each country. Um, you can see that in Belgium, for example, there are 1,200 pacemaker implantations per million population annually. Uh, the implantation of pacemakers in the United States is about 800 devices per million of the population annually. When you get to the far right of the diagram, the numbers of implants are so small that they, they don't even show on this graph uh, because they are in single digits. Only a handful of patients in countries like Kenya or Nigeria receive a pacemaker um, at the present time. Uh, PASCAR is a uh, Pan-African Society of Cardiology and uh, we've worked with them closely. Uh, they conducted a, a similar survey um, and their survey was published in Europace in 2017. It showed that there was no consistent access to a single pacing site in a third of African countries. Uh, those countries um, would be here represented in, uh, in white. Um, the authors also found that implantation rate was twofold, 200 fold lower than it is in Europe or United States. Um, similar disparity uh, in access to therapy exists for defibrillators, which I'm not going to cover, uh, but uh, was also part of the survey that was done. And of course, the, the disparities are even more dramatic when it comes to ablation procedures, which are extremely high cost and require a lot of uh, infrastructure. So let's look at the reasons behind poor access to uh, CIDs in low and middle income countries. There's a general lack of comprehensive national health insurance coverage in those countries. There's also lack of private insurance. Um, this results in the vast majority of the population uh, paying out of pocket for their health expenditures. So out of pocket 
uh, contribution is the, the greatest part of the healthcare expenses in those countries. There's poor access to ECGs, holters, and event monitors. There's lack of facilities with both fluoroscopy and operating room capabilities. There's a low number of trained practitioners and support staff. Um, and low uh, penet penetration of device manufacturers and distributors, since most patients are not able to afford pacemakers. Uh, and finally, the, the cost of uh, these cardiac uh, implantable electronic devices is very high relative to the overall health budgets in those countries and personal budgets of patients. Uh, the World Bank defines low-income country as one in which per capita income is uh, under $1,100. And the uh, lower-income countries are from $1,100 to $4,000. Many of the countries that we work in, the, uh, the per capita income is under $4,000, making uh, the purchase of a pacemaker uh, out of reach for most patients. However, um, the reuse of pacemakers and defibrillators actually is happening. Uh, it happens through mission trips uh, and sometimes through local sourcing and reprocessing at the hospitals in Africa or South America or Asia. Um, on one hand, you could say that the approach is limited but also common. And of course, we have no idea of how actually prevalent it is other than by anecdotal evidence of me engaging in you know, physicians and speaking about the topic. I know this is happening. Um, there are no established protocols and no process validation has been proposed. And all of this is uh, occurring outside of the legal and regulatory approval. Um, a validated protocolized refurbishment could revolutionize patient access to pacemakers and defibrillators. And that's what uh, Project My Heart, Your Heart is all about. Uh, let me shift uh, our focus to the possible role uh, of post-mortem pacemaker uh, use in the United States um, or harvesting of those devices in the United States. Um, in the United States, about 250,000 pacemakers are implanted annually and about 100,000 ICDs are implanted uh, per year. A growing number of Americans, as you can see on the right-hand side in the uh, slide, a growing number of Americans choose to be cremated uh, due to a variety of influences, um, including evolving attitudes regarding death. Um, one of the considerations is cost. Cremation is much less expensive than a burial. The chart shows that uh, the percentage of the deceased in the United States who are cremated rose from about a third in 2007 to almost 60% in 2022. Uh, the rise is expected to level off at about 70 to 75% in the next few decades, according to the Cremation Association of North America. But the reason why all of this is relevant is that pacemakers and defibrillators, by virtue of their lithium iodide battery uh, explode in the cremation equipment, uh, damaging furnaces um, in, in which temperatures oftentimes exceed 1200 degrees Fahrenheit. So it is a matter of practicality then uh, pacemakers and defibrillators must be removed prior to cremation while they don't have to be removed when patients uh, are buried in the ground or the deceased are buried in the ground. So this is one reason that we think that the supply of uh, devices and el uh, eligible for potential, potential reuses is, is very large. Um, what I will show uh, starting with this slide and over the next several minutes is the sort of the data that has been accumulated up to this point um, on uh, our, under, like our ability to understand the role of reconditioned devices and how they can help uh, improve access to patient care. Um, this uh, this study was one of the early studies that Dr. Tamir Baman 
uh, uh, authored as the first author in our group. Uh, it was one of the early attempts to understand really what the published literature was up to that point. Um, so what Tamir did is he he performed the meta-analysis of previously published data on pacemaker reuse. This was specifically about pacemakers and excluded uh, defibrillators. Uh, the study ranged from 1970 uh, to 2010. Uh, and so he found 18 studies that satisfied the search criteria. Um, the number in the pooled analysis was uh, almost 2,300. Um, the countries represented in these studies were um, India, uh, Sweden, Israel, Austria, Canada, and, and many others. All these studies had outcomes such as pacemaker infection or device erosion and device malfunction defined as a defect in the structural or electrical integrity of the pulse generator. So the meta-analyses, uh, in this meta-analysis, he found five studies that actually had cohort comparisons of reconditioned versus new pacemakers. Uh, let me direct you to the forest plot on the left-hand side of the screen. As you can see, when you combine all five trials, there were a total of 913 reused devices compared to about 6,700 new device implants. Of the reuse group, there were 20, 29 infections uh, and the new devices had 270 infections. Since the uh, solid triangle is not to the, to the right of uh, line one, uh, the unity of one, uh, there was no significant difference in infections. Thus, reused devices are not at increased risk of infection for their patients, according to this pooled analysis. On the right-hand side, you have the from the same paper analysis of the uh, mechanical malfunction rates. And so indeed, in this, in this uh, aspect, the, the findings were that there was an increased risk of malfunction in the reuse group. Uh, and it was actually a almost six-fold greater risk of there being a device malfunction. Uh, the original papers did not specify very clearly about what those malfunctions were, but most of them, when it was indicated, were due to set screw problems, which are apparent at the time of placing the device. So they may not be necessarily delayed malfunction later on. Um, overall, in this uh, in this pooled analysis, um, the pacemaker reuse uh, was associated with about 2% risk of infection, and the device malfunction was still low at 1%, even though it was six-fold greater for the reconditioned device versus the new devices. In 2019, uh, Dr. Sinha from Johns Hopkins University um, drove the effort to update the meta-analyses. And th this was uh, inclusive of all the studies in the preceding um, uh, eight or 10 years since the publication of Dr. Bauman's analysis. And it also included defibrillators, not just pacemakers. Um, and so they actually uh, showed that in this more up-to-date analysis of more contemporary studies, there was no significant difference between infection uh, and uh, between um, device malfunction or device-related death uh, in uh, these patients who had reconditioned devices versus new devices, providing further um, evidence uh, to the body of evidence that uh, pacemaker reuse and ICD reuse is probably safe. Uh, the last study I will mention uh, uh, before moving on is the, um, the study that was published in New England Journal of Medicine by uh, a Canadian group, uh, a program that started in 1983, began a prospective registry in 2003, uh, the countries where the devices were implanted were Mexico, Dominican Republic, Guatemala, and Honduras, so four uh, Latin American countries. 
And um, there were about uh, um, 1,050 patients with re-sterilized devices. And the authors matched uh, their outcomes to, uh, to a carefully matched cohort from Canada. Uh, with the primary uh, outcome in this analysis being infection or, or device-related death. And so the authors in this retrospect, uh, well, actually prospective registry, but uh, like a, a study looking at the previous almost 20 years found that the infection rate with the reused devices was 2%. Uh, the Canadian matched cohort had an the risk of infection of 1.2%. Um, and so there was an increased risk of infection in, in this cohort, uh, but it did not reach uh, statistical significance. So there was basically a trend toward more infections, but this was a non-randomized study. Um, and the, you know, the, the, the match group was uh, one that uh, was very different from the patients living in the in the low income countries. So all this evidence suggests that we could potentially do this, but um, the problem is that the uh, cardiac implantable electronic devices are packaged and sold as single use devices approved by the FDA, and that um, according to the FDA uh, uh, and based on guidelines uh, which are directed through the um, Congre Congressional Act from 2002, um, anyone who reprocesses devices must adhere to the same handling and product standards as the original manufacturer, um, including quality system regulation, medical device reporting, registration, pre-market approval and notification, and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> FDA has approved reprocessing of EB catheters, dialysis catheters, and other medical equipment, but it called a pacemaker reuse in one of its uh, 20 or 30 year old um, documents an objectionable practice. And so pacemaker reuse is considered an objectionable practice and is not allowed uh, in the United States. So what our group did over the next, uh, you know, over the last uh, 10 years or so, is we actually um, wanted to build a case uh, on how important it is to, um, to do this, you know, since it's a controversial practice and you could potentially get in trouble for doing it, you know, can we build alliances? Can we build partnerships to, uh, to make sure that what we're doing is not considered outrageous, but rather it's considered reasonable? Uh, we started with uh, with surveys of the um, funeral industry uh, and patients in our cardiovascular uh, center and their families. And we found that uh, most uh, of the time, the devices um, uh, in funeral homes were discarded. Only 3% of the funeral directors around uh, our center had actually ever returned devices to the manufacturer. And then on the right-hand side, you see results to the sort of the, um, the question that was asked to the funeral directors, uh, the patients with devices, and then family members in our cardiovascular waiting areas uh, about their approval for a possible pacemaker reuse. And so definitely 70 to 80% of uh, folks thought that they would be uh, in, in favor of uh, pacemaker reuse, and they might actually contribute to by donating their device uh, post-mortem. Uh, we also surveyed the Heart Rhythm Society members. Uh, um, we got 430 responses with a response rate of 13%. Two, uh, three fourths of the uh, responders were from the United States. And uh, the, when we asked the question, what, what is your greatest concern regarding the realization of post-mortem pacemakers or ICDs? The, the answer was infection or device malfunction. Um, a few people, however, had also concerns in terms of uh, uh, how ethical this might be, knowing that the devices might not be as reliable uh, potentially as uh, a new, new device. Uh, we also asked them during the same survey 
uh, to answer uh, affirmatively or negatively on the on the following questions. Uh, I believe resterialization of CIEDs with more than 70% of battery reclaimed from the deceased in order to implant them in patients who cannot afford any device may be safe, is ethical if proven safe, may be a reasonable alternative, um, and would be comfortable, the, the provider would be comfortable with asking for donation or even implanting if legal. And so if you look at this, uh, the vast majority of the Heart Rhythm Society members either strongly agree or agree that um, reconditioning and reuse of pacemakers uh, may be reasonable uh, and that they would be willing to participate in it if given a chance, if given a framework to do it. Finally, in terms of these surveys, this is the last one I'm going to uh, bring up. Uh, this was a patient survey. Uh, so we, we surveyed patients in cardiology clinics in Nicaragua, Ecuador, Lebanon, and Pakistan. And we pulled the data together and we found that the recipients of these devices, potential recipients, should they need them, despite knowing that the devices came from a cadaver and another human being had the device implanted, still uh, three out of four uh, folks wanted a new device or wanted to uh, avail themselves of a reconditioned device if they could not afford it. And so I think that uh, provides uh, additional support for the fact that what we're hoping to provide is actually welcomed by, uh, by patients who are well-informed of the origin of the devices. Uh, let me now shift gear to what our minimum criteria for uh, ICD and pacemaker reuse are. So Dr. Bauman again uh, wrote a, a, a very nice uh, feasibility study. This was in the first uh, couple of years of us doing this. Um, we actually um, partnered with Implant Recycling, which is a re reprocessor, like a metal reprocessor that's based out of Detroit uh, to kind of disseminate information about our program we also sent flyers to uh, funeral homes and crematories that we could identify. And over the first two years, we accumulated a few thousand devices and we did this broad analysis of, if we assume that the minimum criteria for pacemaker ICD reuse is four years of battery life remaining, what is the yield when we actually provide a means for the funeral homes and crematories to donate the devices, ship them to us through uh, postal service, uh, and what can we do with this? And so among pacemakers, the yield was about 15%, and it increased to about 30% for biventricular ICDs, probably because the mortality of patients who receive biventricular ICDs is so high. What's actually interesting that the more recent data uh, suggests that these yields are higher, and that's because we've already established relationships with those crematories or funeral homes and so they're not offering their uh, assortment of 10-year-old devices, but rather uh, on a quarterly basis or more frequently, they will ship us devices that they uh, extract from uh, from the deceased. And we're able to see that actually the, the yields of these devices that we think are usable are uh, greater than from this original feasibility study. Uh, we also did a uh, study on... Uh, uh, the batteries that were explanted during procedures at our cardiovascular center. So after excluding all uh, elective replacement indicator devices, we found that half of the devices that we were actually removing from patients, either due to infection or due to an upgrade uh, from one type of device to another, 50% of devices actually had that minimum threshold of four years of battery life remaining. Uh, saying that this is really a potential uh, high yield opportunity for us to receive devices and um, know that all the shipping that's been paid for, uh, all the money that's been paid for shipping is actually yielding a higher um, product than, uh, than from funeral homes. And so we created this uh, collaborative. Um, so the Cardiovascular Center at the University of Michigan is in the center of it. Um, 
but we have uh, a few partners. Uh, we, as I mentioned before, we partner with Implant Recycling. Uh, they are in the business of uh, reclaiming metal from crematories. Most of the metal that they receive um, is in the form of uh, hips or knees. Um, and they basically provide the service for the uh, for the funeral industry. And on top of it, they're actually taking the uh, pacemakers and ICD separately and they, they're forwarding them to us. Um, we are actually physically based. We have several rooms at uh, World Medical Relief. It's an organization that's been in existence for about seven decades in the suburban Detroit area in Southfield, Michigan. Um, we also uh, have partnered with Any Scientific, which is a um, reprocessing company out of uh, Connecticut. Uh, Mr. Craig Almendiger, who's, whose father was a cardiac surgeon who actually trained at the University of Michigan, uh, runs this business and they're, they're in the business of reprocessing uh, medical equipment. And so they have like an FDA permit uh, and they know exactly what they're doing. So they, they do our uh, cleaning and sterilization for us. And I also should acknowledge Pace for Life, which is a sister charity out of the United Kingdom uh, that's uh, run by uh, Dr. Joel Dunning, uh, who has really uh, collaborated with us um, fabulously over the last several years. And we've been able to uh, get a lot of context, uh, additional context for our uh, project. All right, so um, this is a photograph of donated uh, pacemakers and defibrillators that we received from Implant Recycling. Um, we also received them from funeral homes in smaller envelopes, crematories. We received them from hospitals and individuals. Um, in addition to obtaining the devices uh, from uh, those folks, sometimes we actually get them from patients' families after the patient has uh, died or while they're taking care of the arrangements for the funeral. Anyone can request a postage paid envelope at the website that I'm showing there. Um, and we provide a postage paid self-addressed envelope with a biohazard uh, Ziploc. And those donations come directly to World Medical Relief, which is in Southfield, uh, Michigan. Uh, what we do first uh, is we do initial evaluation and decontamination uh, at, uh, at the facility. We have um, a large number of medical students uh, and even more so undergrad students and high school students who volunteer their time on Saturday mornings. And um, a bunch of them is able to go through literally hundreds of devices within an hour. And so you have uh, you have some pictures here on the left and hand side, and the, and the center picture that show the the volunteers who are really enjoying themselves doing this, uh, potentially gnarly thing. Um, and then on the right hand side, what I'm showing is a, a generator, um, which as you know consists of a, a titanic uh, or titanium encasement, but also epoxy header. And what I'm showing here is the fact that there are seal plugs that are on top of set screws. And we have developed a, a method to actually remove the seal plugs and the set screws to clean the headers uh, to the specifications that the FDA thought was appropriate. Uh, that's not how we started the process, but that's what we essentially evolved to doing. And as a result, we then created you know, a new potential problem because we have to now reinsert it, reassemble it, and we have to show that the, the whole process is sound from the beginning to the end. Uh, when we get those devices, we ship them to any scientific. Um, as I mentioned, the, the Waterbury, Connecticut uh, business uh, run by Dr. by uh, Mr. Almenegger. And uh, here are some couple pictures of what the initial cleaning and decon decontamination looks like. Um, and uh, you can use pipe cleaners to um, to improve the yield inside the header. After the devices have been reprocessed by them, meaning they are free of biological debris, they're clean but not really sterilized yet, 
uh, they are packaged appropriately and sent to us back to Southfield, Michigan. And we, uh, with the help of Eric, our uh, program manager and uh, volunteer device nurses, we actually um, test the devices that are already cleaned and make sure that they are appropriate. Um, so on the left-hand side of this picture, you see that we have a computer which is hooked up to a heart simulator. That allows us to actually create, um, like imitate intracardiac electrograms that are then appropriately sensed by the device. So we, so we make sure that the device can appropriately sense the signals. Uh, the piece of equipment in the middle of that picture is an oscilloscope. An oscilloscope is a, um, it's a device where you can measure uh, frequency and the voltage and the um, pulse duration of uh, electrical signals. So we reprogram the device to, let's say, two and a half volts at 0.4 milliseconds to five volts to one milli at one millisecond. We confirm that what the device actually, the output from the device is what we program it to be. And then on the right-hand side, you see a, a company-specific, uh, in this case, uh, Abbott uh, programmer, which we use to run a variety of these tests. When we started this process with uh, Noah Klugman, who's, who was a, at the time a PhD student in uh, computer engineering at the University of Michigan, uh, it took us eight hours to evaluate one device because we were always uh, stumbled, we always stumbled upon something. But ultimately, the process has evolved so that it takes about five to six minutes for Eric and a device nurse to basically uh, attest that the device electrical functioning uh, is proper. And so we do all these various tests that I'm, uh, I'm listing on the right-hand side. Um, we, as I said, we do device testing and then we have to do a reassembly. I do wanna uh, uh, show you on the, on the picture on the left-hand side, uh, you see Eric and me, we're wearing masks and we're actually you know, handling the devices appropriately. And, and the person who's there is uh, Mr. Sheldon Davis, uh, who has been a major uh, contributor to, and supporter of our product. And this is a gentleman who, um, uh, in the early device, uh, in the early years of device therapy, like pacemakers, defibrillators, and valves, uh, he had a business of distributing those things. So he felt uh, a, a particular uh, affinity to our work and has been uh, very generously supporting it. On the right-hand side, you see what happens to the devices after they've been electrically tested, after the, the set screws were put in, seal plugs put in. In order to keep the seal plugs in, we use a special grade, elect, you know, special medicinal grade glue and um, medical grade silicone. And so Eric dips the headers of the devices, the epoxy part of the device, four different times, uh, at appropriate time intervals to make sure that the, the seal plugs do not fall off from the device because we took them out and we reinserted them. And after that, the devices go back to any scientific where they are packaged and sterilized. Um, on the, in the middle uh, picture, you see what the packaging looks like. There are double Tyvex pouches. Tyvex pouches allow for ethylene uh, ethylene oxide to permeate it and kill bacteria that are inside, but it does not allow any other dirt or anything else to get inside. Um, these the, these products are labeled as uh, for export use only. They cannot be used in the United States, and they have serial numbers and, and, and you know, a variety of indicators that actually makes them trackable uh, along the entire process that we have from beginning to end. Uh, those envelopes are then put into boxes that have foam uh, and um, the packaging essentially is uh, one of the things that the FDA has uh, sanctioned um, uh, in our uh, protocols. So the one thing I wanna highlight is that everything happens uh, per protocol. Um, and at each step, the devices are tracked. Uh, let me spend a few minutes talking to you about the FDA export permit. So uh, as I indicated, the, the FDA exercises authority over 
any medical equipment that's approved for human use, which is reprocessed. And so we de facto become reprocessors. Um, and so in order for this to be legal in the United States, we had to engage the FDA and to obtain a so-called um, export permit. And the export permit is a vehicle that the FDA issues uh, to allow um, exportation of reprocessed devices that are not necessarily approved for use in the United States. It uses the pre-market 510K clearance format, uh, but it's not as strict. Um, and it, it basically, the FDA assesses whether there is a public health interest in uh, these devices being available and whether we have uh, shown a minimum safety behind the product. Uh, and also uh, the FDA requires that there's actually a government permit from the recipient country, from, from the recipient country's government to say that this importation is allowed. Uh, because, because as you can imagine, pacemaker reuse is not allowed in any jurisdiction in the world, except under the auspices of our program, as far as I know. And so in order to engage the FDA, we actually spent about two years validating the process. We performed destructive tests and non-destructive tests. And let me just uh, share with you some of that information. Um, so the table here shows our validation of cleanliness and sterility um, based on the destructive tests. Um, the testing that we performed uh, adheres to the various international and industry standards in terms of native bio burden, culture growth, protein residuals, hemoglobin residual. Um, we also tested total organic carbon, cytotoxicity, intracutaneous reactivity, pyrogenicity, and ethylene oxide residues. This is what normally a reprocessor, let's say an, a reprocessor of a um, EP catheter uh, these are the sort of the norms that the reprocessor has to meet before the product can be introduced into the United States for reuse. And so we actually, with the help of any scientific, we have replicated that uh, stringent determination of uh, of what of how actually free of debris our devices are. Uh, I mentioned to you how we remove the seal plugs and. You know, we have a process of putting them back in, and we we did experiments with with our uh, computer science uh, and engineering students um, on basically assessing how how well those seal plugs uh, stay affixed to the device, and we we met standards that are expected to be met. Um, an interesting test that we also did is we uh, we actually tested the leakage of current through our. Uh, septa through our seal plugs. Um, and we met the industry standard of less than 40 uh, uh, kilo ohms as being the resistance across the uh, across the seal plug. We also performed packaging validation and uh, you know various tests that uh, that uh, any scientific has to do for for their other products that they do uh, for their business where basically you have to assure that the packaging actually is resilient to the different things that can happen. So let me now switch gears and tell you more about the, the trial that's ongoing. The, that's the most um, exciting and important thing that we're doing right now. It's a randomized, multi-center, single-blind, non-inferiority study where we provide both the refurbished and new pacemakers and all the leads and accessories that go with it. The primary endpoint in the trial is freedom from infection at 12 months. And the secondary endpoint, we determine to be freedom from pacemaker software or hardware malfunction uh, or unexplained death at 12 months. Uh, inclusion criteria are that uh, patients have to have uh, indication for a de novo device, that they have no financial means of getting a, a new pacemaker and that they consent appropriately. Um, we are not able to enroll patients who cannot comply with follow-up, who have severe comorbidities that might shorten their, their longevity. Um, however, patients who 
do not um, qualify for the study are eligible to receive the devices outside of the clinical trial. So if there's a patient who is in complete heart block and needs a device, even if they're on dialysis, we're able to provide the device uh, under the registry, uh, but they're not randomized to the in the clinical trial. Um, and so I, I pretty much mentioned most of these things. We obviously have to assure that we have a government letter from the country where the trial is being done, that there are investigators and personnel and the uh, infrastructure to support it, and that that folks are aware of just the, the basic research uh, follow-up uh, functions. Uh, we require follow-ups at one to two weeks, two months, and then every six months. Um, the So currently, the active uh, countries in which the clinical trial is happening, and some of these countries have more than one location where we're actually randomizing. Uh, it started with Sierra Leone in 2018. You can see on the graph on the right, this is the enrollment in clinical trial over the years. Um, we started in 2018. Um, at the time, I was under this um, belief, which was uh, pretty naive, that I would be able to travel to all these places and request device donations by companies. And then in an underhanded way, randomized patients to new devices versus reconditioned devices. Uh, it, it, of course, that was an extremely difficult task. Um, and then we had COVID, uh, which uh, um, slowed everything down. But ultimately, in 2022 and 2023, we have had a, a huge uh, surge in our enrollment uh, to the point that in the first quarter of this year, we should finish the enrollment in the trial. Um, the countries in which we uh, in which we work uh, include Sierra Leone, Kenya, Nigeria, Venezuela, Paraguay, Mexico, and Mozambique. So a wide array of countries uh, in both Africa and uh, and America. Let me shift to the some of the ethical, legal, and regulatory issues that are involved. Um, you know, as I mentioned, the devices are single-use devices. It's an objectionable practice to reprocess them. There's no jurisdiction in the world that allows it. And so we wanted to create a framework for a sustainable large-scale reuse that would be done out in the open. World Health Organization um, has issued a document in 2000 that um, there should be no double standard in quality. If the quality of an item is unacceptable in the donor country, it is also unacceptable as a donation. And so that presents a real challenge for us. And so we, we've actually engaged with some ethicists and we've written three papers on the ethics of pacemaker reuse. And I will just touch some highlights here. Now, the assumptions here are, are we offering a lesser device? Um, and we are. There are similar risks of infection, we believe. There is a potentially higher but non-prohibitive malfunction risk. But there definitely is a shorter battery longevity, which will result in more frequent replacements that are needed and what goes with it, uh, increased risk of complications of generic replacements. So what rationale can we advance to address the ethical issues surrounding this topic? Well, Aristotle once said, uh, health of body and mind is so fundamental to the good life that if we believe men have any personal rights at all as human beings, they have an absolute right to such a measure of good health as society and society alone is able to give them. And so this statement made over 2000 years ago um, is, is a clear indication to us that we really ought to look at this issue from the perspective of society and the right to healthcare. Um, some of the broad considerations for the reuse, uh, you know, um, you invoke principles of justice, equality of opportunity, um, and then the, the notion of the society as not being a national, but a global society. And so we don't have only responsibility to uh, our you know, the citizens of our country in which we function. And we, you know, 
should insist on justice, but also across the globe. Um, and so some of these other uh, principles that I will invoke here um, come from the Bellman Report in terms of research uh, guidelines, um, obligation, we have an obligation to prevent sickness or death whenever we can, believing that pacemaker and ICD reuse is safe and effective requires of us that we act to reduce the harm to the underserved patients. And we have a responsibility to maximize the benefits while minimizing any potential harm. Uh, the principle of util utilitarianism, which is to provide the greatest good for the greatest number of persons also applies here. By reprocessing the device, we increase supply of the devices. And so we decrease the unmet need. And even for patients who are perhaps on the cusp of being able to afford a device, but if they buy the device, if the family pulls the money to buy the device, maybe they cannot send their child to school. So it's, it's basically allowing uh, patients and their families to function better than they would, even if they were able to actually scrounge up the, the resources for the, for the, uh, for the device. Um, and so what, uh, what we believe is that the allocation of new versus refurbished devices should be on the maximum, on the basis of maximum benefit rather than geography. Um, in the interest of time, I will skip through a couple of these uh, slides here. Um, essentially, all these uh, different principles apply here, but um, unlike the WHO, uh, we believe that what's really important is equal quality of ICDs. Um, it's not the equal quality of ICDs or pacemakers, but equal access to them that really should uh, guide our approach to, to uh, ethical considerations of uh, device reuse. Mm -hmm. uh, let me skip over this as well. Um, there is a, there's some, some other issues about uh, personal autonomy. Obviously, the patient who gets the device um, has to know about its uh, status in the donor country. Uh, the, uh, the devices that we receive have been donated by patients or their families after they uh, died. So we actually respect personal autonomy in our processes uh, by respecting the donor and the recipient autonomy. <clears throat> we also believe that we have certain responsibilities as reprocessors. Um, we need to assess risk and create procedures and guidelines that are safe. We have to adhere to the protocol. We have to assure quality of reprocessing. We need ongoing registry to monitor outcomes. And we offer replacement device in case of an advisory for which we uh, vigilantly uh, search continuously. So, as I'm coming to the end of this presentation, I wanted to sort of zoom out of this and kind of tell you sort of what the journey has been and where we're hoping that we are moving. As I mentioned earlier, what we really want is we don't want to just reprocess the devices, but we want to create a blueprint for how any center or any other entity that or non-government organization wants to use to basically follow this protocol-driven approach. Um, we obviously have to conclude the, and publish the clinical trial of pacemaker we use and offer registry devices of reconditioned pacemakers in all those countries where the permits allow us to do that. Um, we are now in the phase of approaching the FDA to develop a protocol for appropriate ICD evaluation, and we will then establish a registry and if, um, if we have the resources and a, a clinical trial to randomized patients to new versus reconditioned defibrillators. Um, we will seek regulatory approvals for large scale reuse. Uh, we work with uh, ACC, HRS and other organizations to raise public awareness. And our main uh, goal for the next several years is going to be grow this model. We should be able to offer thousands of devices to patients in a couple of years, if um, if we continue to uh, receive uh, funding 
uh, from our fundraising uh, endeavors. Currently, the the project is really supported through the University of Michigan through the donations to the university for this specific project. But uh, the as as this project grows out of the university and into the open world, uh, it will need uh, ongoing support and uh, and permanent staff outside of the university. <clears throat> I want to acknowledge all the um, partners that we have um, in this endeavor. As I mentioned, um, the, the University of Michigan Cardiovascular Center has uh, given us grants to get the project going. Pace for Life has been a phenomenal um, collaborator. Implant Recycling has tremendously expanded our access to the funeral industry. Uh, World Medical Relief has uh, allowed us to uh, uh, to establish the center in their facility uh, where the devices are being kept um, in perfect conditions uh, and uh, we're able to reprocess them there. And of course, any scientific, which has over the years uh, for free reprocess all of the devices that we've been needing. Um, and I want to uh, acknowledge um, some of my colleagues, uh, unfortunately, I don't have a picture of everybody, <laughs> um, but the picture on the left was actually made yesterday after our conference. So Eva Klein Rogers, uh, there and there's me, Patsy Bringer, Eric Perol, who's our program manager and, and Tina uh, are an integral part of our team. And I do wanna uh, acknowledge uh, Craig Olmendiger, who has again, uh, over the last 10 years, been a steadfast supporter of us and has donated his company's resources toward reprocessing the devices, <clears throat> excuse me, for us for free. I want to also acknowledge Dr. Eagle uh, and Dr. Frolic, um, Sheldon uh, and Marion Davis. Uh, you've seen the picture of Sheldon uh, in one of the prior pictures. Uh, Jay Snell was a uh, employee of uh, St. Jude. Um, when he actually helped us design many of the protocols that we're working on uh, that, that are allowing us to repress the devices. Noah Klugman is a, is a PhD person in uh, electronics who actually developed computer science and electronics who have developed the, the testing um, uh, equipment. Uh, Lane Powell is his wife who's also very helpful in a great number of ways. And then um, also when I acknowledge the device nurses from our institution that week after week come for a few hours at a time to reprocess these devices with Eric. And then Joel Donning, who is from uh, Pace for Life and AJ Hell uh, that I've just recently connected with in the last uh, maybe two months, uh, two, uh, six months or so. Uh, and he is um, providing to be an extension of work that we're doing. We're good at reprocessing. Uh, but Pace for Life and AJ are, are phenomenal at developing relationships across the world. So I'll just finish with this quote. Um, this is from Ralph Waldo Emerson. To know even one life has breathed easier because you have lived, this is to have succeeded. This is the motto that all of us, uh, those whose pictures you have seen and those whose, whose images you have not seen, uh, an army of people here at the University of Michigan, World Medical Relief, any scientific, implant recycling, are uh, working every week to make this uh, process a reality because we believe that this is uh, an, an incredibly important contribution that we make uh, being citizens of the world. Uh, and that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions if there's time left. Thank um, you so uh, much. Oh, somebody had a question? Yeah, I, I have a I have one here. Um, Sam Omotoya here, calling in from um, Cleveland Clinic. Uh, Dr. Crawford, I think I've met you uh, some years ago. Uh, thank you so much for uh, carefully unpacking these uh, very difficult, convoluted, uh, discussion around um, healthcare access, actually, in, in developing countries. This is very dear to my heart because, you know, I'm a colleague of Dr. Kiro and 
Uh, these are some of the initiatives that she has done and some of the things that I've participated in uh, in other parts of Africa. Um, you, you've, 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 you've really demonstrated, you know, a, and and clarified some of the convoluted challenges that uh, that's involved in in access to to you know healthcare as well as devices in these parts of the world. And as I listen to your presentation, uh, the 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 crux of what I'm what I'm hearing is that you know access is limited mostly by you know unavailable resources locally, and and, and I'm presuming that this initiative, as altruistic as it is, uh, may not be sufficient to actually meet those needs. And also, there is there is competing, uh, you know, initiative that has a much more uh, financial, you know, undertone to it, uh, which may require some other stakeholders to participate, uh, such as the uh, device uh, companies, uh, you know, political appetite in those local uh, countries, and patient access as well as well as those that implant those devices locally. Uh, you did mention things about, you know, training, uh, availability for, uh, you know, local electrophysiologists in those countries, uh, rather than electrophysiologists that will come from the, you know, developed world uh, to go to those countries to implant them so that there'll be some continuity of care. There's also, you know, the, the, the situation of, uh, the device uh, follow-ups and local, locally available, uh, you know, protocol and systems to do that, uh, and device clinic and so on, that will make this, you know, even much much bigger, uh, you know, view uh, uh, as we unpack as we unpack it. The the two questions or three that I have is one, mm -hmm. when these devices are, are donated. Uh, is it uh, free to the patients? Because I see that any scientific, you know, uh, you know, send it out and they've been doing it for free. But when the patient gets it, is it free? And secondly, um, the leads themselves, are they also uh, kind of cleaned the same way the, the can are cleaned? And then thirdly, um, how do we prevent... Uh, if it's free to those patients in those uh, you know, or those countries, how do we prevent a financial motivation uh, for local implanters, you know, when they get to those uh, to those countries? Because if a patient is receiving it for free, uh, you know, is there an alignment between, you know, how that is, you know, uh, received and and who is implanting it, and whether that's a financial motive to do so, to do so, and whether or not when any scientific uh, sends those things across, are the device companies still responsible for their label? Uh, if, for example, a Medtronic device was uh, you know, reused and repurposed, but they are repackaged by any scientific, what kind of uh, regulatory responsibility uh, or not do the original uh, device manufacturer have uh, for those okay. devices. Thank okay, you. well, let me address that because I do have answers to all the questions you raise. And, you know, first of all, I'm just presenting a slice of what we're providing the directly. This is the sort of our core mission to provide the devices. But over the years, we have worked through ACC and Heart Rhythm Society. Uh, and now we've benefited from um, sort of from um, the knowledge and connections that. Uh, that uh, AJ Hale and uh, Igioma has. Um, and so we are actually, over this amount of time, part of the reason why it took us a, a long time is because we want to make sure that the places that were implanting devices had a, a fixed presence. And so all of our patients who are enrolled, there are physicians in those locations that are committed to being there and being available for uh servicing the patients. The devices are free, absolutely free. The devices are also, the, the leads in the clinical trial are free. 
the leads outside of the trial in the registry, patients have to pay for it. Um, we're not able to control any type of charges that the hospital may impose for the OR time, uh, but we do provide, uh, you know, an IRB fee and and some um, some fees to help with the with follow up appointments in the clinical trial. Um, you know, because uh, this is a liable to abuse, as you've mentioned, you know, financial motivation. Um, what we try to do is we we establish connections with people that we trust, and we do this by um, traveling and meeting with them, by meeting the patients that we've implanted, and getting a vibe from the patients about whether this was truly a donated product. I have no indication that any of the devices that we've offered were uh, inappropriately handled, but it is true that as we grow this effort, and it becomes much more widespread, uh, such problems may evolve. And um, you know, I think it will take a lot of heads uh, put together to, to decide how to best prevent that from happening. Um, you know, of course, in terms of the companies being responsible for the labels. So, you know, we consider ourselves to be responsible for pro providing the care to those patients remotely to the extent that the local physician uh, is helping, and if they have any questions, they um, uh, they contact us. But um, there's a whole effort being created now to actually create a um, through the Reese Foundation and the work that AJ Hell is doing in Egeoma to basically create a a teaching opportunity for various physicians to learn how to do this to organize. Um, missions that would go periodically to certain locations to make sure that we reinforce the protocols. Uh, and that's that's going to be a, a life's long journey. Uh, it will, you know, but we we are excited to do it and and we're, you know, we're providing the one piece of this big puzzle, the device. And there's a lot more that needs to be done. And and we are very happy to collaborate with anybody who is willing to help along the way. Thank you. Yes, sir. Dr. Yusuf, you had a question. No, no, I just, I just want to thank Tom because I think uh, he, what he's doing is so challenging because he, he came to Pakistan with us and uh, to, to fill up the political situation and the people who want to make money in that part of the world, they make it very difficult for people to have this. So it's, it's a very, very tough job unless you go with him and you see what he does is it's just, it's commendable. And that uh, he has rounded with us, and he has seen how I don't know where WHO is getting it. They're, they're forty-year-old people. One person, I think Tom remembers, we rounding, and his family had to sell the house to get a pacemaker. So I don't know. I, this is this is what is, I, for me personally speaking, this is very dear to my heart, and probably in my whole lifetime, this is the project that I think will change the way medicine is practiced throughout the world. Every year, of, every year in Pakistan is 40, 40, 50 years who need pacemaker, and they are the only people who feed the family. So you can you can imagine how what situation we have in that part of the world. Yep. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. I no, thank, would you like to thank you very much. And uh, from yeah, so you know what I can tell you is that the world, you know? I I never lose hope about being able to work in one country or another. And sometimes yeah. there's an interlude of five or eight years from the initial time when we started working on something and maybe we couldn't get a government letter and then there's some breakthrough a bit later. Um, so, you know, we, we never lose hope and we always, uh, you know, we always get uh, inquiries from lots of places. Um, we've been able to, you know, do this clinical trial in, in a select few countries, but we actually have permits for twice as many countries, except something is missing in those countries. Maybe there is no implant position. Maybe there is no C arm. Um, you have the government letter, but you don't have anything else. So it, it's a it's a hodgepodge that we try to fill, uh, and with the concerted effort of us and anybody else who wants to help us, uh, we can save. Some. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, maybe from the folks that are live. Okay, 
Well, thank you so much, Dr. Crawford. So oh, somebody... Yeah, what well, the interesting thing was, you know, we need to also educate our own people because I, I saw saw that even in your heart rhythm society, 60% people had had concern about um, infection when you already have published the data and before 2014, our infection rate is only around 2%. Right. Well, and you know, what we're hoping is that our prospective randomized trial, which has not been done ever before, uh, mm -hmm. we hope it will make a big splash and, and headlines. And I, I hope that the perception about this will, will change as information becomes available. So, you know, uh, being able to engage with, uh, with other physicians and with society at large is, is an interesting of what we're trying to do is to basically bring awareness to this issue, um, you know, pre prevent basically patients from um, dying with their devices and taking them with them, uh, which, uh, you know, I, I get lots of emails from, from the grief families that say, you know, my mother really would have been so relieved to know that we were able to donate this device to your program. You know, we're honoring our our mother by doing this. And we, you know, it, it just creates a lot of, um, a lot of good feelings for a lot of people. And so there, there are benefits, not only directly to the, um, to the patients who get the devices, but also to the family members who are mourning the loss of their loved one. Well, again, just in the interest of time, I'll just close this out. But before we do, thank you so much for, you know, coming to our Grand Rounds. It's a perfect note to end the year and go into the holiday season. Um, I've told you myself how, you know, impactful your work has been um, changing lives. I've seen, you know, the great increase in device use in Nigeria. And, you know, from me and my colleagues to you, I truly appreciate it. Thank you for your work dedication and um thank you to everybody for coming thank you thank very you much. thank you thank you bye-bye bye-bye